good afternoon to everyone here in Brazil. And I think it is still good morning to Professor Marta. And I want to welcome you all here. Uh, this is the opening week of classes in our graduate program in chemical and biochemical process engineering. So we have some Master of Science, Sciences and Doctor of Science students that are beginning this week. Uh, today we are very happy and honored to have the presentation of Professor Marta Grover. It's entitled Cycles and Systems, Ratcheting Third Life. Uh, Marta is a professor, professor in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at Georgia Tech, which she joined it in 2003. Her research program is dedicated to understanding, modeling, and engineering the self-assembly of atoms and small molecules to create large-scale structures and complex functionality. She combines modeling and experiments in different applications using PSE approaches. In 2019, Marta received the Himmelblau Award for innovations in computer-based chemical engineering education. Um, I think I, I should have also uh, told that Marta is a mechanical engineer. Uh, she was graduated from the University of Illinois and then she had uh, her Master of Sciences and Doctor of Sciences from Caltech. Um, Marta is also one of the organized, organizers of the CAS AICHE project, Women in PSE. And uh, we have a collaboration with Marta. Marcelo Guedes, uh, Doctor, of Science, uh, Doctor of Sciences Research from COPY, he spent a sandwich period at Georgia Tech working with the control of crystal size and shape in crystallization processes. And also last year, Marta participated in our LADIS uh, GENSCOP control seminars. In that occasion, she gave the seminar model-based control of self-assembly. So Marta, thank you very much for being with us again today, for giving this talk to our students and our professors. Thank you very much. I will pass the word to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very glad to be here and thank you for the kind introduction. And I will take just a moment to pull up my slides. Can you see my screen? Yes, not, yes. not yet. You, you are I seeing it. I can't see you. No? no? You no, are I seeing it. You. The you problem can't? is with you, Edward. You are seeing no, it. Okay. I'm so sorry because I can't see it. Never mind. It, well, I can see I can see it too. Okay, I should go ahead. Yeah, now I've seen it. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about a different topic than, than I talked about um, in my fall presentation, if, if you saw that. So um, uh, Mauricio in particular asked uh, me to talk more about uh, some of our work in origins of life in the transition from chemistry to biology on the early Earth four billion years ago. And uh, so I'll be talking about um, how I think process systems engineering uh, can play an important role in uh, trying to understand the origin of life on Earth. And um, first, I just wanted to you know, point out uh, that I'm coming from Georgia Tech or Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. So Atlanta is in the capital of the state of Georgia and we're in the Northwest corner. So we're really not near the ocean at all. Um, uh, we're up here, but we are in the city. Uh, and so this is our campus, uh, Georgia Tech building and uh, the, the city of Atlanta. And Atlanta is the home of Coca-Cola and home of CNN uh, and also uh, has proud tradition in civil rights and human rights. So it's the birthplace and home of Martin Luther King Jr. 
um, and uh, also mm -hmm. the Human Rights uh, Center and Library of the Carter Center. So Jimmy Carter was uh, the governor of Georgia and is from Georgia and still lives in Georgia, in fact. So I'm going to talk about two application areas in my research group um, that are different than the small molecule uh, crystallization that um, I've been collaborating uh, with Marcellus on and, and, and y'all. Um, so the first motivation I'll talk about very briefly is in the crystallization of conjugated polymers. And the application for that is in large area flexible electronics. So our electronics are mostly made from silicon and silicon works really well uh, for many applications, solar cells, computers, um, but it's very rigid. And, um, and so that makes it expensive to process. Um, you have to heat it very, very high temperature. And so there's a lot of interest in polymer well, organic electronics, and then um, particularly in polymer organic electronics, because they could be printed as inks over large areas. And so you could have um, you know, flexible electronics that you could wear. You could have solar cells as uh, shade, window shades that could roll up. Um, you could have uh, large area lighting that you print. And um, uh, maybe more importantly, that you could uh, print these electronics in a roll-to-roll -roll process, sort of like a newspaper. So the processing could be uh, very, very inexpensive using uh, ink formulations that contain these uh, conjugated polymers in, in solvents with additional additives. So we've been working um, over the last uh, probably almost 10 years um, on manufacturing processes for polymer organic electronics. And in, in terms of our studies, we've focused mostly on the very common semiconducting polymer poly 3 hexylthiophene. So it has these, these rings um, that stack and uh, it conducts electricity. Um, it's actually a hole conductor as opposed to an electronic electron conductor. Um, but there are many ways that we can process this polymer to create these thin films. We can process the solution and, and have nucleation and growth of these fibers prior to deposition. And then we can also uh, uh, have different ways of depositing the film, like with this blade. And there are a lot of design parameters there as well. And so we've been really focusing on quantitating and modeling around the structure of the thin films. We can have some indirect measures of the structure through spectroscopy, like ultraviolet spectroscopy or um, diffraction-based studies in more sort of exotic facilities um, to create these organic field effect transistors, um, similar in structure to a silicon-based transistor. Um, but what we've been trying to do, one of the things we've been trying to do is really to quantitate the more direct structural information that we see in atomic force microscopy images. So when material scientists often show um, uh, have studies around uh, polymer electronics like P3HD, they often show these images from atomic force microscopy of kind of micron scale structure, um, but it's just viewed very qualitatively and it's not quantitated. Um, but often these sorts of fiber structures and morphologies are referred to as being important, but in a very qualitative sort of way. Um, and so we've been trying to relate that structure to the charge uh, carrier mobility so the property of the field effect transistor. And um, so, th so, so the structure of these films are more complicated than many of our small molecule crystallization studies on paracetamol, for example, and or salt crystallization. Um, and the reason is that we have these polymers that have these um, rings that contain a sulfur there, that's the poly 3 hexothiophene is the sulfur there, and they have these alkyl chains um, and they form these pi stacks. Now the, we want to conduct electricity between the electrodes, but, um, but and, and the backbone here conducts electricity well. The problem is um, that the, the chains don't go all the way across the electrodes. They're not that long. And so even if we can orient the chains in this direction, we're going to have contact points between the chains. Um, and then we're also going to have uh, high mobility along these pi stacks between the chains, 
um, but very low mobility between these alkyl chains. And so there's a lot of um, structural features here that are important in relating how the chains crystallize, basically. They, they generally don't fully crystallize because they're polymers, so they're entangled, but they can partially crystallize to form these pi stacks and that all affects ultimately the performance of the device. So I want to spend more of my talk uh, on the origins of life work, um, but uh, I also wanted to mention this as an additional um, application in the group where we're moving, we're looking at crystallization and assembly, but we're moving beyond um, features seen in small molecule crystallization into some more complexities uh, that are associated with polymer assembly, and in this case, in a materials application. Um, and we've been using a different approaches uh, to uh, address, to bring in data, um, and to try to still take a systematic um, approach to this engineering problem using constructing databases, um, developing uh, software like GT Fiber to uh, quantitate these, this image data. And um, also then to come up with some hypotheses based on uh, 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 extracting knowledge from this data um, and have postulated that the orientational order between these fibers is um, really important to the final mobility. Um, and so if we can create films that have domains where the fibers are ordered, it doesn't matter so much um, what are the length of the individual fibers that form, but we wanna have um, the alignment of these fibers so that we can have a charge transport between them. And that's really that that's the rate limiting step um, to the charge transport in the film. Um, so we've distributed some software here um, for the, the image processing and also have a database uh, uh, available um, that we've been mining and that others can mine. And so here are some of, so this work has been conducted in collaboration with Elsa Reichmanis. Um, my uh, longtime colleague in, in chemical engineering at Georgia Tech and, and two of our graduate students here who published um, some of the, the papers that are mentioned here. Um, but I would, as I mentioned, I'd like to spend more time talking about chemical evolution. Uh, so uh, much of this work is motivated by trying to understand how life might have started on the early Earth four billion years ago. Um, uh, it's also, it's been funded by the National Science Foundation under the Center for Chemical Evolution, um, but also co-funded by NASA. So NASA is very interested in the question of origin of life on Earth because NASA goes to other planets looking for life and they need to know what to measure <laughs> and what to look for. Um, and so we only have one data point on life um, and that's life on our Earth, which is a planet. <laughs> So uh, it's really very important to try to understand how life um, started on our planet in order to go to other planets and to look for life. So, um, so that's a major motivation to understand the origin of life, but we'd also like to understand more broadly how collections of molecules can evolve and how we might use those principles to create um, therapeutics, to create smart materials, um, and so we have also a, more, a broader view on trying to understand how, how collections of molecules can evolve and how that is different from biological evolution based on reproduction, um, whereas chemical evolution might be based more on some kind of replication. So we want to understand how chemical evolution is different from biological evolution. And the goal here is to design and demonstrate uh, systems that are, that are considered to be pre biotically plausible, they might be consistent with conditions on the Earth four billion years ago, but to construct minimal systems that can um, polymerize. So we want to store information and polymers aren't the only way to store information, but they're how life stores information through our DNA. And um, they're, they're a good way to store information chemically. So uh, focus on systems that can polymerize, that can store and then transfer information um, and then can catalyze reactions. So in our bodies, we have so many different reactions uh, being catalyzed by enzymes. And uh, so that's also, um, uh, enzymes are another kind of biopolymer. They store a different kind of information through amino acids, and that's um, connected to uh, DNA through our genetic code. 
Um, and so we have these different kinds of biopolymers that are acting cooperatively in our bodies um, and that undergo selection and evolution. So um, also uh, we would like to find a common environment in which nucleic acid polymers, peptides, lipids, polysaccharides could all be generated and could be um, uh, evolving. Um, so that's not a requirement, but that's also a nice, a nice feature. And there are some a uh, number of outstanding kind of open problems in the origins community that we have have really motivated our studies and the design of our systems. So I'm going to mention three here. One is called the water problem. So the biopolymers of life are all formed through condensation reactions. So uh, water is generated and um, and this has been viewed as a problem because if you have polymers in water, um, they will hydrolyze. <laughs> the water will hydrolyze. And so you think, well, life probably started in water because we're so water-based and they're the oceans. So probably there was water, but then that would just break down all the polymers back into monomer. So that's, um, that's kind of hard to understand. Um, another problem uh, that has been longstanding in the community is called the strand inhibition problem. It's really product inhibition. And this has to do with, in particular, with DNA and RNA duplex forming systems. Um, if we want to make transfer information um, in, in DNA or RNA, we can heat two strands and separate them, and then each of them could be copied. Um, the problem is if we cool down the system to make the copies, to have the, the, the short pieces or the monomers attached to the, the strands, um, the thermodynamically stable state of the system is to go back to the duplex. And so it's very hard to copy DNA um, in aqueous buffer without enzymes, you know, but we don't have enzymes yet, evolved enzymes at the origin of life. So that's another outstanding problem called the strand inhibition problem. And then a third problem is the single winner scenario. So many theoretical models for chemical evolution um, are based on having different strands of DNA or RNA that have different replication rates. And then it turns out mathematically, you can show that there's a single winner. And the single winner is the, the, the sequence that can replicate the fastest. So um, uh, the selection is only based on the replication rate and it just doesn't lead to a productive outcome uh, because uh, our bodies are full of uh, different kinds of molecules, different sequences, you know, different enzymes. The diversity is really essential for creating the complex function through cooperative uh, behavior between these different individual sequences. So having a single winner is really not consistent with, with life. So uh, we have been looking for scenarios in which we would not just have a single winner, but in which the selection would not just be simply for the fastest uh, replicator because selection and evolution require sustained diversity so that we can you know, continue to have new ideas and select among you know, diverse um, options. And so much of this work uh, has been centered around the concept of cyclic environments. So this comes back to the title um, and that uh, if you do a chemistry experiment in the lab, you probably want to do it at constant temperature. And ideally, you would control the humidity as well. We don't always do that in Atlanta. It gets humid in the summer, and so that can affect our experiments. Um, but we really would like to have a controlled environment so that we can you know, do careful experiments and understand the underlying phenomenon and model it. Um, however, in a natural environment, there are cycles. So the Earth is a spinning planet and it rotates around the sun. So we have day and night and we have seasons and this creates cyclic environments. So um, if we really wanna understand how life began um, in, a, in the natural environment, um, it's really important to think about these uh, cyclic conditions and that it could actually, it seems like it could be very helpful um, to uh, move forward um, the generation of functional biopolymers. And so in particular, we'll think about day and night cycles, but really any cycles are fine to think about. Um, but you know, the sun comes up and then it gets hot and then that drives mass transfer water evaporation. Uh, and then we might have some kind of possibly viscous uh, non-aqueous 
medium here with some biopolymers in it. Um, but then at night, it cools down, dew will form. Um, there could be a tight, this could be a tidal cycle as well. Um, but then after cooling, then um, it could be wet. And so then we would have cold and wet at night. And so these alternate, and that could actually allow us potentially to ratchet forward um, in the dry phase to have our condensation polymerization going on. Um, and then uh, there, you know, water is sometimes around, you know, but maybe it's cold then, so the reactions are slower. And so we can kind of ratchet forward our, um, our polymerization process. So that can help us get around the water problem. Uh, so these cycles could happen due to day, night, si tidal, seasonal. They could even be spatial cycles um, with some kind of convective uh, flow. Um, but they can lead to um, changes in uh, temperature, uh, hydration. That can drive pH swings um, through concentration and rehydration. We can have uh, photochemistry going on from you know, light and dark. So there are many possible conditions that could be cycling. Um, but ultimately, the, this is driven by um, the influx of solar energy, um, as well as tidal energy from, from the moon. Um, and that's allowing us to, to uh, sustain a non-equilibrium state of the, of the system through this um, in continual influx of solar energy. Um, and because we have cycles, we can have different events going on at different parts of the phase. Um, so sometimes we'll have polymerization, in the dry phase, but then we can also have hydrolysis in a hydrated phase, and that might be important for reshuffling of sequences. Um, we can have duplex formation during a hot period, and then strand, and then uh, reannealing of the duplex um, during a cold period. Um, and so, but really, in the natural environment, um, we would be likely to have uh, dry together with hot, and wet together with cold, and that seems very important for driving forward. Um, condensation polymerization. Now, if our cycle instead was hot and wet, we would just break everything down and then cold and dry, and then nothing would happen. <laughs> so actually the fact that, that um, heating drives dehydration um, actually seems, seems pretty important to this phenomenon. Um, and in addition, uh, another important feature of many of our systems are non-aqueous solvents. Even though life you know, may have started with water being very important, um, at certain times, uh, maybe in a dehydration cycle, there would be non-aqueous solvents that could help drive forward our condensation and polymerization, could also modulate melting temperatures um, and promote maybe intramolecular folding. Um, and so that's, that's gonna be another uh, important part of our system design. So here's, here's one uh, PowerPoint uh, schematic um, uh, uh, that's, that's one way to think about how chemical evolution might happen. And, and this is really based on thinking about uh, peptides and amino acids more than um, nucleic acid polymers. Uh, but we might have free amino acids, uh, monomers here in solution. Um, and then uh, it gets hot and there's evaporation. And so now we're in a concentrated state um, and then as it gets even hotter, uh, bonds could start to form in this concentrated state and uh, with water being driven off again, uh, uh, moving the condensation polymerization forward. Um, but then um, at night, it uh, becomes night and it's cool and there's hydration, maybe through dew um, or possibly rain. Um, and and this, is a, this is a key point um, that could lead to selection. So some of these peptides uh, might form structures, whereas others would remain unstructured. And this could be uh, a form of selection where in a, in a warmer hydrated state, the structured sequences could be protected from hydrolysis, whereas the unstructured sequences would break back down again. So this could be a way to select for structured sequences that would be more likely to act as enzymes and catalyze reactions through their structure. And then the cycle you know, would, would continue. So we have been using mathematical modeling to try to understand the system level behavior when we have um, you know, pretty simple chemical and physical events going on in our system. And we use this approach. Uh, uh, this was led by a postdoc, uh, Sarah Walker, who's now a faculty member at Arizona State. Um, and she's, she investigated the hypothesis that the first 
functional biopolymer could have been a sequence that made more monomer and that would allow it to replicate faster. Um, but we distinguish this very much from just having a sequence that replicated faster it, because the coupling was really through the local resources, um, not the inherent replication rate. But here's the model, which is very, very simple. Um, we have two phases, a dehydrated phase, day phase, and a hydrated night phase. And during the dehydrated phase, we have three, uh, two different events that could happen. We only have two types of monomers. You could think of them as two of the bases, two of the four bases for DNA and RNA, um, but we call them A and B. And so we had events where a new sequence could form spontaneously. And the rate constant, we have a rate constant here, and then uh, just a second order reaction rate in monomer concentration. Um, so this is a very simplified model, even though we assume that we form 20 mers, um, which are kind of long enough to potentially have function. And then um, we also can have replication of our existing sequences, and that has its own rate constant that, again, is dependent on the, the local resources. And then in the night phase, uh, we can hydrolyze sequences through this hydrolysis rate. We just assume they fully decompose. So again, this is a very simple model. And then we have two different uh, Ficky and diffusion events. The polymers can hop and the monomers can hop. And the monomers hop uh, more uh, faster than, than the polymers do. So uh, we were able to uh, run simulations with you know, different sets of these five parameters. And um, we would track the total population of polymers. And so pretty quickly over you know, the first year, maybe uh, 365 cycles, we would, we would get up to a really sustained uh, total population of polymers. But there's a lot of dynamics associated with the individual sequences, the species. And we just numbered our sequences. We didn't really keep track of the particular sequence of A's and B's because it wasn't really relevant to our simulations. But we had thousands of sequences and we would track First, we would just make sequences. We started with no sequences. We would make sequences, and then some of them would really take off, and others would go extinct, and some would kind of, you know, be around here at a low, kind of a low level. Later on, we would have new sequences that also would, would spontaneously form, but, but that was ha uh, slower later on because a lot of our material was, um, was contained in these polymers. So then, then there would be a slower rate of making new sequences. And then um, we, we tracked the polymer concentration as well as the monomer concentration over, over these cycles. And so there are a couple of things you can, you can see here. Um, one is that we have these clusters that formed um, of, of polymers. And that's actually not something that we built in in terms of thermodynamic interactions. It was sort of, it was surprising to us, um, but we could rationalize it based on um, the local resources. And that local resources of monomers would be uh, contained in the polymers but then at night, uh, some of the polymers would break down. And because we had a limited diffusion rate, the polymers nearby could then use that material you know, in the next morning. <laughs> so they would eat each other. <laughs> um, but there we have this recycling of resources that led to this clustering phenomenon. And then over cycles, these clusters coarsened. Um, and so some clusters contain more than one sequence, although early on, um, each cluster just kind of had one sequence and it was just replicating itself. But then um, later on, we would have multiple sequences in the same cluster. And then we could also track the monomer concentration. But you can basically see that if there's a, if there's a cluster of polymers here, then the monomer concentration is lower. Um, but there's this kind of back, background, or sorry, in this case, in this, in this, at this point in the cycle, it's, it's higher. Um, and then we also have this background of monomers that's kind of everywhere, that's diffusing around and is a shared resource. So, but the study was motivated by, by the hypothesis that the first functional polymer was uh, a, a sequence that made more monomer, okay? So we didn't explicitly model, model the catalysis of a, a, of a peptide sequence here, but we, we postulated um, that if an azyme appeared at a particular time and location, um, uh, that uh, that would that would you know change the system dynamics, which which it did. Okay, so uh, this this column here shows having no functional sequences, okay? and we show polymer concentration, concentration of A monomer, and concentration of B monomer. So if we have an azyme that appears, um, then 
at, at, after 2,500 cycles. Okay? So a sequence is randomly nucleated. It has a particular catalytic function that can convert a local resource into more A monomer. Um, that this cluster, you know, becomes much larger. And in fact, these two clusters merge. Okay. So this cluster here uh, is definitely benefits the most, but actually everyone benefits um, by having um, the shared monomer resource that diffuses around, but does so with a, a limit in a limited way. So that the functional sequence through autocatalysis, through positive feedback, you know, can amplify and have a greater role in the population, um, you know, which we can see here. Um, uh, the black curve compared to the red curve, you know, but also everybody gets to benefit. Um, another thing that we can see is that there's now there's an excess of A monomer. <laughs> so our B gets depleted and we can't fully utilize our A um, uh, because we have excess. But then if at a later time at 4,000 cycles, um, a Bzyme appears at a different location, different time, um, that then uh, we can uh, really bootstrap up the entire population much higher with the blue curve here relative to the red um, based on the azyme. And we can fully, you know, much better utilize our monomer, res monomer resources and um, uh, that both of these clusters really grow very significantly. You know, here we didn't even really see anything going on over here, but now these, you know, this cluster has merged with this new cluster and um, in a, can, can have a cooperative fashion. But the, the important, the important, an important point here is that, um, uh, you know, early on at the origin of life, it's hard to imagine that, you know, a whole like cooperative cycle of enzymes would have just happened, you know, at the same time, um, but that it could happen stepwise here. There could be one function um, that was helpful uh, and through limited diffusion, we could still get amplification, autocatalysis of that um, enzyme. But by creating more monomers, then the entire system has more monomers. It can explore sequence space faster, maybe more rapidly discover this bezyme. Um, and then when that emerges, then there could be this cooperative uh, reaction cycle that um, mimics some of the, the primitive um, behavior uh, in, in life, in metabolism. So some of the insights that we took away from this study are that, um, that, that it certainly is a, a system level problem. This is not a reductionist sort of problem based on a single you know, rate limiting step that we can understand. Um, there are, we want, and also that we, there's a sweet spot. We don't wanna have too much or too little of our reaction uh, uh, events, but we wanna have a balance. So we wanted some reversibility in our polymerization so that we could continue to explore sequence space and not just lock up all of our material into certain sequences. Um, but we didn't wanna have too much reversibility at night because if we broke everything up, we'd have no heredity. And every day would just be you know, a restart of the same thing. So we wouldn't be able to ratchet forward. Um, oh, similarly, we needed some diffusion of our monomer and polymer species, especially the monomer species for resource allocation so that there could be a cooperative behavior. Um, but we needed limited diffusion so that we could select for the functional sequences so they could benefit more from their own function from the fruits of their labor. Um, and then we also uh, demonstrated how a cooperative network could emerge stepwise, the first the azyme and then the bzyme at a later uh, time and a different location coupled through diffusion. Um, also, we saw this clustering that, that we didn't really expect um, to see, um, but that could provide a model for early compartmentalization, um, having limited diffusion on surfaces uh, before uh, the, the advent of lipid-based cells. Um, but we want, really wanted to take this, uh, the lessons learned here into the design of our experimental systems. So uh, we definitely wanted to use polymers to encode information. Um, we understood that we needed some reversibility in our polymer backbone so that we could recycle these monomers um, and continue to discover new sequences, not just lock everything up into uh, a, a fixed number of sequences because most sequences will not be catalytic. So we need to continue to discover new sequences. Um, also environmental cycling was very important in the study um, because we wanted to drive different events at different times. We wanted to have polymerization sometimes, but we wanted to also be able to uh, hydrolyze our polymers for the monomer recycling, you know, for the reversibility. Um, limited diffusion was also very important to bias 
our mobility of different species. And then ultimately, we, we really want to uh, demonstrate selection based on function, which is still a goal. It's not something that we have yet achieved, but it's what we're working towards. Um, so um, within the Center for Chemical Evolution, I've been collaborating with a number of researchers um, on the origin of nucleic acid polymers and also the origin of peptides. So I'm going to very briefly mention our work in nucleic acid replication involving cycles to overcome the strand inhibition problem I mentioned earlier. So in aqueous buffer, you can have a, a DNA or RNA duplex, and you could have some shorter pieces here that you would want to uh, you know, transfer information. Uh, onto by making a copy. And so you can heat the system and melt the two strands, so separate the two strands. But what happens in, in aqueous buffer, if you cool down, um, you just go back here again. You don't make any progress. You don't ratchet forward. So um, we have been exploring alternative solvents or mixed aqueous uh, and non-aqueous solvents uh, in order to delay the reannealing of the strands, possibly by uh, creating hairpins and other intramolecular structures um, that could then uh, have uh, catalysis. Okay, so that could be act as ribozymes, so um, nucleic acid-based enzymes. Um, but also these these trapped structures also um, could provide a way for these short pieces to come in and kind of open up, uh, as something's called toe holds, um, and open up and coat. Uh, the strands still, there's still oligomers here, these short pieces, but we could make a copy. And then we could ligate, uh, so then actually make the polymer backbone, and then, then we would actually have a copy. And again, we can continue to go around the cycle every day. Uh, and so this work has been conducted by a number of um, students in the center, uh, chemical engineering students, as well as, as chemistry students. So Christine He was the first graduate student who demonstrated this approach, published that in 2017. Um, Adriana Lozoya Kalinas, Kalinas is a chemist, recent chemistry PhD student who I co-advised who's just joined um, UC University of California Irvine as a postdoc and so she was very involved in demonstrating the catalysis um, and uh, of this RNA system and in also looking at some other more prebiotic um, solvents than, than the ones we originally considered and Chiamaka Obinor just graduated um, uh, last month. I'm going to hood her tomorrow. Um, and uh, she's been working in prebiotic uh, mechanisms for ligation, for executing the ligation. So we're really trying to put together an entire system that would be prebiotically plausible um, that could demonstrate uh, this sort of selection without enzymes. But um, in the remaining time, I'm going to talk about our work in um, the origin of peptides that uh, including work on uh, uh, more of modeling and analysis. Um, the idea here is that the amide bond may have not been the original peptide bond. Um, it's, uh, but, but rather there might've been an earlier version um, and that earlier version might have been polyester. So the ester is, um, it comes from having a carboxylic acid react with a hydroxy group <clears throat> to form a polymer. And so this could be lactic acid, polylactic acid. It's common biomaterial used for sutures. Um, and these polyesters are catalyzed by the ribosome. Um, it doesn't only make amide bonds, it also makes ester bonds. Um, and, but the ester bonds polymerize much more readily than the amide bonds. And so this idea was suggested a number of years ago um, by Leslie Orgel. Uh, a leading researcher in origins of life chemistry. Um, but it was kind of rejected a little bit because, um, because it was thought that the esters were not stable enough. Um, so, um, but we started looking into um, how these polyesters might be synthesized um, using day-night cycles. Um, so there are a couple of reasons why amino acids might uh, not really form peptides, might not form polymers without enzymes. Um, one reason is that if you have two amino acids, uh, so you have the carboxylic acid group reacting with the amine group, you can form a dimer. It's kind of hard, actually. It's thermodynamically unfavored, but, um, uh, but then it tends to form the cyclic dimer, and that's very stable and kind of a dead end to further polymerization. Um, so, it, but hydroxy acids are very chemically similar to amino acids, and, and so if we have glycine here, the simplest amino acid, the the hydroxy acid version is glycolic acid. So just exchange here, the amine group 
for the OH group in all of these. So alanine has lactic acid, spartic acid has malic acid. Okay, so um, we have these analogs that have the same side chains, um, but will have a different backbone. Now, um, uh, amino acid uh, uh, formation is unfavorable, whereas ester is kind of neutrally, fav slightly favorable. Um, uh, but also this cyclization here is, is reversible because it's just uh, not as stable of a bond. Right. So uh, in 2014, uh, I worked with a postdoc in our center, Rina Mamajanov, um, and she uh, led a study with a number of undergraduate students um, where we wanted to understand how hydroxy acids could polymerize under these day-night cycles. And so this is a very simple experiment. We use malic acid um, as the amino acid because it's soluble in water, and that helped our characterization and our modeling. Um, uh, but, but really, we just put malic acid in water. We didn't have any buffering or you know, anything else that we added, just water. And we dried it and then rehydrated it under different um, wet, wet temperatures. We always had the same dry temperature of 85 degrees C. And uh, first, so that we created a kinetic model. We made some predictions about how the monomer concentration would go down in the hot phase. And then, but it would come back to different extents depending on the temperature of the wet phase, uh, where red is the hotter temperature and blue is the cooler temperature. Um, and we looked at dimer concentration, trimer, and longer concentration. And so we could see this kind of ratcheting forward for a few cycles and then, and then kind of settling into a limit cycle, a, a periodic steady state. And so we did the experiments as well. And we got um, very good qualitative agreement and I would say pretty good quantitative agreement. Um, and so we were able to show that we could have a population of these polymers that could be generated in a natural environment. Um, but in the course of then this research, um, uh, we, our narrative in this first paper was, okay, well, life later could have evolved to two amides because they're more stable. But then we realized that actually, if you just put the amino acids in with the hydroxy acids, you get ester amide exchange. And so you can actually form amide bonds because you have the hydroxy acids present. And you form these copolymers that are called Depsy peptides. That name had al is al already, was already around. We didn't um, uh, discover that, but, but it hadn't been considered in origins of life chemistry. So if we just dry down lactic acid, we form polymers. If we just dry down the glycine, um, the amino acid, we don't really get anything. Um, but if we dry down the mixture, we get all of these different copolymers. So uh, this could be a way to form an early version of peptides called Depsy peptides that are copolymers, um, or it could just be simply a catalyst. The hydroxy acid is a catalyst uh, to form peptides. And so characterizing these copolymers is pretty challenging, um, but within the center, we were able to collaborate with Facundo Fernandez, who's a chemistry professor at Georgia Tech, and working with his postdoc, Jay Forsyth, who was a lead author on the previous paper, develop a workflow for characterizing these, uh, all these sequences using chromatography and mass spec and, and uh, breaking down the peptides to sequence them um, in a high throughput fashion. There are actually so many sequences, even though we only had four monomers, so many sequences, we couldn't enumerate them all. What we had to do is measure the masses that we saw experimentally and then see which sequences would be consistent with those masses. So there was really a huge kind of informatics challenge here, but we, we borrowed from proteomics study proteins for our, our Depsy peptides, and we could look at you know, the prevalence of different uh, sequences at different positions. We always had the hydroxy acid on the end because of how the ester amide exchange works um, in order to understand were these sequences random or was there some favorability in certain sequences, certain masses that, or certain uh, amino acids at certain positions in the sequence. Um, but uh, within, within my group, we did a lot of work in trying to model and understand these reactions. One, one challenge that we had is that the lactic acid would evaporate during the drying process. And then when we rehydrated, we weren't really sure how much to add back or if we should add any back. And so um, we decided to create this closed system. It's just a closed tube that goes through an oven door. So this is the inside of the oven and the outside of the oven. Um, but this allowed us to heat and then we would evaporate both water and lactic acid, but then each day we could just dump it back in order to study the system of a lactic acid. And we considered the reaction with valine. The reason we considered the amino acid of valine, um, which has uh, this kind of bulky group here, is um, that we wanted to get good chromatographic separation between, um, so that we could separately measure the valine lactic acid dimer 
um, and the lactic acid valine dimer. One has ester bond, one has amide bond. Um, we could see, we could distinguish them based on the ester bond would uh, degrade much faster than the amide bond, but we wanted, in order, um, order to do the modeling, we really wanted to quantitate those separately. We also built a population balance model to describe these sequences. Um, and so uh, the computationally, um, uh, this got pretty involved um, to enumerate all the different sequences, to think of all the possibilities, um, but we only had a few parameters. Uh, we, we would track the concentration of sequences with different ends, hydroxy end or uh, amine end, and also the number of hydroxy acids and the number of amino acids uh, or sorry, the number of ester bonds and the number of amide bonds in that, in that polymer. So we didn't track all sequences, uh, but we kind of tracked how many bonds. Um, and uh, then we also had to, had to track um, uh, the ester amide exchange reaction. And so it led to having all these like binomial distribution coefficients of all the possibilities. Um, uh, but in the end, we had a small number of uh, parameters in the model. We had two different esterification rates um, depending on the end group, we had a ester hydrolysis rate, um, and then we had this exchange rate for exchanging an ester to an amide bond, and then we had a mass transfer rate for the lactic acid. Um, and so, uh, Sheng Sheng Yu was a graduate student, a chemical engineering graduate student who uh, performed this this study, um, and so he quantitated nine different species. Many of them are lactic acid polymers; those were easier to quantitate for us. Um, but also the two heterodimers of the valine and the lactic acid, as well as valine monomer, um, and separately tracking the evaporated lactic acid. So he did these experiments drawing down at four different temperatures from 65 to 95. We generally try to stay below 100 so we don't boil the water, but um, we do, can get pretty hot. And one thing that I think is really remarkable is that for these rate constants and mass transfer coefficient, even though we were drying down, we were going from a solution state to a dry state, somehow these rate constants were still um, very much following Arrhenius behavior, um, which you know is not really expected, but um, uh, I do think is notable. <laughs> and then because we had these activation energies, we could break that down into uh, the Gibbs energy into an enthalpic and entropic component, and we could construct a free energy diagram for the direct formation of uh, an amide bond that has this higher barrier to this two-state reaction where first we form the ester bond and then we have the exchange reaction. And that, that kind of showed how we were able to lower that barrier um, through the ester amide exchange to uh, facilitate the formation of the amide bond. Um, and we could also then look at the enthalpic and the entropic components and show that what was really going on with our exchange reaction was to lower the entropic component, um, uh, not so much really affecting the enthalpic component. Um, so we're continuing on this work in a number of directions. One is to really better understand the thermodynamic driving forces. Um, and this is a collaboration with my chemistry uh, colleague at Georgia Tech, uh, Charles Leota, and our graduate student in chemical engineering, Calvin Smith. Um, and we're trying to understand how the ionization state of the hydroxy acid and the amino acid um, uh, is, is playing a role in, in the driving force and what is the thermodynamic driving force under different um, hydration states um, to, to understand, understand that using dense load functional theory, but also um, more reaction engineering kind of modeling as well and to bring those together. We're also looking at the assembly or crystallization of the Depsy peptides um, with the idea that we could have structure-based selection. You know, so if we have assembled Depsy peptides, uh, then they could potentially be protected from attack by water, uh, and that could provide this structural selection. And so we're in particular looking at, does that, we've constructed these, uh, synthesized these heterodimers um, that have one lactic acid, one amino acid and one hydroxy acid, and we're then cycling them um, to, to uh, create uh, uh, assembly uh, through these amphiphilic Depsy peptides. Um, and under wet-dry cycling, we see the structure formation um, uh, that evolves over multiple uh, wet and dry cycles, and we can get selection for certain sequences. Um, so uh, that, that, that concludes my presentation. I um, just wanted to give a few insights uh, before, before wrapping up. So originally we thought um, that these hydroxy acids that are, that are, are present uh, are chemically very similar to amino acids. They are present in model prebiotic reactions. 
um, and on meteorites that may also have delivered significant material on the early Earth, um, that they could have played the role of amino acids in prebiotic chemistry. Um, but then as we were conducting the research, we realized that actually the hydroxy acid can catalyze amide bond formation, and so they could be the catalyst. Um, and so there are kind of multiple ways here that the hydroxy acids could be important and that depsy peptides could be an important um, intermediary um, in the evolution to, to uh, peptides based on amide bonds. Um, we also were able to get some insight into this water problem, um, realizing through our research that the water and the hydrolysis was actually really important for searching sequence space to continue to sustain, to generate and sustain diversity in our sequence pool. And um, the fact that all of our biopolymers are based on condensation polymerization is actually because they could evolve. <laughs> so it's really not a problem at all. Actually, condensation problems were selected um, by biology because they could evolve. Um, and that this, this, you know, forward, backward motion, hopefully, you know, ratcheting forward, um, but, but also moving backward is actually essential, uh, essential to evolution. Another thing that I think is quite interesting as a process systems engineer is that so far in all of our experiments, we have been able to describe our system level behavior using very elementary physical and chemical events. Um, we have not had to get into really you know, complicated functional forms for our reactions or for our diffusion, that we can really describe our system using these basic components. But when we put many of them together into the system, we can still uh, achieve uh, non-intuitive results, sometimes surprising results, and but we can really rationalize our data, um, not really requiring any like special magic um, uh, uh, rate laws or anything like that. So uh, with that, I would like to conclude. Um, the Center for Chemical Evolution is a very large center here, and this is one, one picture of, of our center that kind of shows the, the size um, of, of our center. Um, my close collaborator and the leader of the center, the principal investigator, is Nick Hudd, who's a chemistry professor at Georgia Tech. And um, here are four chemical engineering graduate students who I have been the supervisor for. Uh, over the years, whose, whose work I featured, Cheng Sheng Yu, Christine He, Chiamaka obi Muir, and Kelvin Smith. Um, but I've been able to work with many chemistry graduate students as well and, and postdocs. And, um, and this work was funded by <clears throat> the Center for Chemical Evolution was a, that was supported by the National Science Foundation, the United States, and NASA. Uh, so thank you uh, for your attention, and I would be very happy to take any questions. Martha, thank you very much. Um, I think, um, as, as I said, this is uh, this seminar is during the first week of classes. So it is very nice for our, uh, because we have mainly chemical engineering students and also other uh, related courses. But I think that uh, these students see that they can use um, the models, and, and you, as you said, you can use uh, elementary physical and chemical events to describe um, such an important um, event that's of itself as the origin of life. So try to answer this. And um, this is very interesting. It's in the basis of the human curiosity. And as we said, we try and we are trying to get information from Mars, for example. So your experiments and studies may help to, as you said, to what to measure, what to look for in the search of life also in other planets. So it's very interesting. I'd like to listen. You to were really you. listening. <laughs> yes, of course. I was very interested, yes, was especially in because yes. in, in you, <laughs> the fact that you are using models and, and uh, in the basis of chemical engineering now, so I was really very interested. Um, I, I'd like to ask, because I have seen that people have written things in the chat, uh, but please uh, feel free to ask questions to our guests. I do have, I do have a question, yes. Mauricio, I raised my okay. hand. Uh, so well. I will pass the... I, I um, just one second, Edward, I am opening here the, yes, I will pass the question to Professor Eduardo Falabella, please. So, um, thank you very much indeed for the beautiful, nice talk you have presented, uh, Professor Grover. Uh, I must confess I'm really delighted. I'm
I'm an eternal apprentice, you know, so I have learned quite a lot from your brilliant uh, talk. But when I first saw the title of your talk, you used the word retching. And that puzzled me a little bit because, you know, retching is a rather it's a comp uh, concept that has been used in economics, you know, meaning a process that once started cannot be reversed. So I was, as I have mentioned, I was a little bit puzzled by that. So allow me to ask you a question which may sound rather simple uh, in a sense that uh, one says in England that birds of a feather flock together. I'm not a bird of a feather, you know. So um, perhaps my question may sound rather simple. But somehow I got the notion from, from your brilliant talk that uh, irreversibility plays a major role in the creation of life. That is to say, uh, in order to create life, one must have a set of consecutive uh, reactions which have to be irreversible, you know. So uh, this has a lot of, of, of implications in thermodynamics, of course, but uh, that's the idea I've got uh, from, from your talk. So could you comment on that a little bit more? I'm a man from Catalyst, you know, so that's the reason why I have this question. Thank you. So um uh, you know i agree the the no mechanical notion of a ratchet usually you know you go forward and stop go forward and stop right so so i guess in my use of the term ratchet um it's it's really about maybe going taking two steps forward and one step back and then two steps forward so maybe it's more like a dance <laughs> um but you know it's 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 not doesn't maybe seem so efficient, you know, um, but, you know, life isn't necessarily efficient. Um, evolution is very slow, <laughs> but, um, but somehow, you know, you go forward and then you come back part way, but, you know, not all the way. And so you're kind of bootstrapping your way, your way up. So that's, that's kind of how I'm using ratchet. Another way to think about it is parallel parking your car you know, we're going back and forth, um, and then, but but really, we're moving in a new direction um, by by kind of moving back and forth. And so that's a no, that's not a notion that I brought up here, but it is a case where cyclic behavior can be used to move in in new directions. And so that could also be important, um, you know, in understanding the origin of life is that we're we're parallel parking our car through these cycles because we can't just translate our car sideways okay thank you very much indeed and again congratulations on your marvelous talk <laughs> as i have mentioned i, I have learned a lot uh, and i have a lot to think about you know <laughs> because uh, well so many information have been provided that uh, well thank you again <laughs> Well, thank you. I, one thing I will say is that, um, I, so I was not aware of really work in this area until I became involved in the research through this, my collaborator, Professor Hud, who invited me, um, you know, to join. And, and, and then I learned that there's a lot of research in chemistry. Um, the Miller-Urey experiments in the 1950s are something that sometimes students learn about in high school and they, where you, to understand how amino acids could be formed the monomers. And then there's also a lot of work in physics because as you point out, you know, there's a lot of thermodynamics here, um, a lot of really interesting basic questions. There are a lot of physicists who work on models. Um, but one thing um, that, that when my collaborator Nick reached out to me, he was looking for someone to do more of a chemically realistic modeling because a lot of the models in physics were more based on like automata, rule-based, you, uh, the game of life, maybe some people have played, and and they weren't really something that he could connect to his experiment. So I actually think chemical engineers could really play a very important role, but there are still very few chemical engineers working in this area. But it's clear that viscosity is important, mass transfer is important, um, as well as, you know, the system level modeling and, you know, the origin of feedback and evolutionary optimization. You know, we use genetic algorithms. You know, there's so many pieces of here that where we have perspective and tools, I think as chemical engineers um, that, uh, you know, can be, can be really necessary, I think. <laughs>
So I, I, you know, I hope that more chemical engineers will, will join this area. I think just we have let me, just let me, just let me tease my colleagues, you know, something you have mentioned. It's clear for me that the most important driving force in the creation of life is catalysis, you know. <laughs> yes. And we, oh, and here's another just thing. Tease, we haven't. Just to tease the, the other guys, you know. <laughs> I understand, but um, but but still, you have a point. So I'm going to say <laughs> that that um, we still in our experimental systems have not. We have some hypotheses, but we have not demonstrated uh, selection based on catalytic function. And so so going forward, that is that is really uh, going to be uh, in the previous work. We were focused a lot on the polymerization piece um, and on the strand overcoming strand inhibition and you know different phenomenon. But none of those are really in the the where the first, this first functional sequence, was it the monomer synthetase, you know, that I talked about in the study? Well, who knows? I don't know, but we don't have a, an experiment to show a sequence that would catalyze making more monomer. But that, that really is the next step um, and the focus of our, our current efforts. That we could have selection for this assembly, you know, but um, that could be an early form of selection. And those assembled sequences might be more likely to be functional, you know, but but we still haven't really done, we haven't demonstrated yet a functional sequence as part of our experimental system. But it's very important. Okay. Now I will pass the word to Professor uh, Seidel. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. Congratulations on a very interesting topic. I would like to know if you investigated, <coughs> investigated the effect of radiation on the processes. I think ultraviolet radiation may have something to do with the changes that you are observing. Absolutely. And we have not, I, I have not. And so I'm, I'm working as part of a larger center and the work I talked about is all very collaborative as well. But there, there are other members of our center who have um, looked at some photochemistry in the past, but I would say it's still a lot of unexplored territory. Um, there are so many different, um, you know, events going on. This is a very complex system, you know, and then just understanding at the reductionist level, the phenomenon is, you know, a big effort and then and then building it into, into the system. But, you know, uh, I, I think certainly there would be, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of radiation um, uh, that that would be would be occurring on the early Earth in terms of what people know, um, and so photochemistry uh, probably was probably was very important um, in forming the ester bonds. You know, I, I'm not so sure, but um, uh, certainly one has to think about radiation damage as well as you know actually generating species. Um, you know that that would be needed. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Mar uh, Maurice told me now that his connection uh, just uh, <laughs> broke. Yes, and asking me to uh, continue with the, the, the questions. And uh, according to him, the next one to, to ask is Marcellus. So, Marcellus, yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Hi, Professor Marta. Sorry, I, I'm not with the camera here, so <laughs> but it's a pleasure and I'm very happy to have you here with us today. It was fantastic, your talk. So I just have two questions. At first, um, you at the beginning of the presentation uh, presented about the nucleation and growth and the deposition of fibers. And I have a question about how it is possible to control nucleation in this case and whether it is possible to use a mathematical modeling for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, how does this differ from the crystallization of small molecules, even the difference of the structure of the fibers? Yes. Um, is it possible to use a variable for I any mean, fiber orientation as, as a mm -hmm. state of the system? I don't know. So in the second one, uh, I saw you use emails to calculate the concentration of polymers and monomers 
So what kind of experimental approach do you use to measure them and to measure the polymer concentration and the monomer concentration? Yes. Thank yeah. you. Good. Good. So um, on the on the first question for the the polymer organic electronics, um, we do um, we have studied um, uh, the uh, nucleation and growth phenomenon um, of these polymers in solution um, to some extent, um, but there's uh, really only kind of scratching the surface. So in some of our papers, we do talk about nucleation and growth phenomenon and. And there's one paper by Michael McBride where uh, he fits a very simple model, this AVME, AVME model, uh, just mm -hmm. is, is really kind of an analytical model. So he, he didn't really do justice to the kind of nucleation growth modeling that we do in our group for small molecule crystallization. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it does get more complicated because there are so many more um, crystalline states uh, than mm -hmm. having a simple crystal lattice. So yes. um, we definitely think about nucleation and growth of the fibers, um, but we haven't um, really undertaken a, a serious nucleation and growth model, and, and really others also have not. Uh, we tried to do some kind of early on, and then it wasn't very effective, and then we kind of took some different, more data informed, you know, materials information, mm -hmm. just kind of mining literature and doing AFM and things. Um, so, uh, but, but it's 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 certainly a way to think about what's going on. But there there are a lot more configurations of the system than than uh, in a small molecule crystallization. But but certainly nucleation and growth is still what's going on, and one can model it in principle. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, and then for the second question, um, now I forgot. Oh, how to measure our monomer and polymer concentrations? Yes, yes. So, you know, I, so I did show one slide about our uh, collaboration, our collaborative work um, with Facundo Fernandez um, in analytical chemistry. Um, but it is a real, an, a real analytical challenge to characterize these systems, even um, systems that only have a few monomers. I mean, this is not like the warm little pond of Darwin that had so many different species. You know, we just have these four different hydroxy acids in water. And hydroxy and amino acids mm -hmm. in water, still very minimal. I thought, said at the beginning, we wanted to design minimal systems that could demonstrate principles of chemical evolution. Um, but even then, um, it's just very challenging. But we do LCMS, so liquid oh, okay. photography, and coupled with mass spec. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what Shang Sheng did, the chemi graduate student who did the population balance model. Now, in, in one of the other papers, and I talked about that more complicated workflow that also had sequencing. So that was LCMSMS. -MS. So I had two mass mm -hmm. specs, one to do the sequencing to break it down. Um, but generally, um, it's LCMS. And so, the, but then we have to be smart about what are we seeing. <laughs> so we need to, you know, identify the different masses um, uh, and, uh, we can do the quantitation. So we can use the mass spec to identify the sequence, the, and then we can do the chromatography to uh, quantitate it. Because the mass spec, yeah. different things ionize differently. So mass spec is not really quantitative, um, but the chromatography is quantitative. So that's why we really needed both. Um, but then we need standards, right? So actually, mm -hmm. the reason why we only quantitated, uh, Sheng Sheng only quantitated the nine species that he did is that we had standards um, or calibration curves for the lactic acid homopolymers. And then we uh, had synthesized standards for the two heterodimers um, that had one amino acid and one hydroxy acid, but we didn't have standards for the other. So without standards, well, then we couldn't quantitate. Yes. Yeah. I see. I got it. Uh, thank you. I, just the last one now, I promise. <laughs> Yeah, also for the cycling polymerization, did you use a, a population balance approach for the predictions or for those cycles? Uh, yes, yes, we did. Yeah. Um, in the the one with just the malic acid, um, we did use a uh, population balance, but yes. it was for homopolymer, and the sequences were very short, so we could just enumerate everything. We had a chain length independent um, polymerization rate. Um, and hydrolysis rate. Yes. Although after doing that study, then we realized the hydrolysis, the, the breakup is more complicated because there's a backbiting mm -hmm. phenomenon mm -hmm. that formed. And so we didn't model that. We just said all bonds could break e e equally. So 
you know, now we're going in and Kelvin is working on understanding the detailed mechanism and more, but with Moran and things, but, um, uh, but anyway, that was a very, that was a very simple population balance model for the malic acid cycling. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much and congratulations. And also for your group and especially for Chamaka and Kelvin that I met. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thank you, it's always great to see you. Thank you, uh, I, my connection had fallen, but now I'm back and uh, I would like to give the word to Professor Seki Ajimiru. Okay, thank you, Mauricio. Uh, you know, Marta, uh, in, the in the 19, now 2019, when we was at uh, DICOPS, no? two years ago, uh, we are talking at the, the dinner table, and I, you mentioned that you are studying your origin of life for the first time. I saw that time that you are joking uh, or just a hobby. <laughs> but, but now I see that you are doing a very serious research with a yeah. very huge group, the research group. Very nice uh, results you have uh, until now. And I hope you can explain everything about your origin of wow. life. Uh, and uh, you know, that uh, I have two questions about your talk when you mention about the, those uh, cyclic environments, you know, daylight and heat and wet and so on. Uh, and wh what about those abnormal events uh, such as electrical discharge during storms? Uh, how this could uh, influence on this uh, sure. explanation of origin of life uh, okay. during the, those mutation or some? Uh, yeah, yeah. Effect? I mean. It there that's 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 very true it could be very very important um in terms of for one thing for selection you know it, and this is one reason why you know us doing a genetic algorithm for optimization is different from evolution um because evolution has a shifting landscape for fitness you know if we do a genetic algorithm for optimization we know what is our our target or, you know, what's our fitness, we specify that. So, you know, in evolution, you know, there are going to be these major selection events that happen, you know, like the asteroid that killed all the dinosaurs, you know, that are these major selection events. And so that's something that um, uh, will certainly, you know, drive forward, um, you know, the path of, of evolution and life and is is not what we're considering with these periodic cyclic environments. So, you know, I think they're both very important for selection, that there can be some, this, you know, this day-night cycle that might just be needed to drive forward, you know, polymerization. Um, but then then there's there then there will also be, you know, ra random events um, that will certainly be significant for the longer term, you know, trajectory. Yeah. But especially I would think about it in terms of this shifting fitness landscape. Um, that 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 certainly would be you know highly stochastic. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so so I did not really talk about stochastic phenomenon other than in our simulation we said we had a stochastic phenomenon would be the creation the 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 the, the um, spontaneous you know uh, uh, polymerization of a functional sequence you know that would that's a so highly stochastic event. Um, but also there's a stochastic environment. It, yeah. We've done some work in, in um, simulating systems with from certain distributions of environments. Um, yeah. you know, but, but, the, but, but the cyclic part is also, you know, that's, that's, it's certainly that's there from, you know, going around the sun and, you know, all that and spinning. So there is also a deterministic, you know. Yeah, because that, that's all, that was my other question because the, out, inside of all these cyclic environments, also there are too many uh, uns, uh, uncertainties in regard to the environmental <laughs> variabilities, uh, so on, leading to too many uh, uncertain model parameters and how to deal with all these. Uh, I, I, yeah. Now you are studying those uh, physical, uh, chemical, physical, uh, elementary reactions mechanisms, very few model parameters, but when you put everything together, you have uh, all these uncertainties. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's why we need robust mechanisms. <laughs> yeah, sure. And, but, but, and, and make a link with that connection with uh, Professor Falabella, and not only connect because that you need the uh, kind of catalysis, but uh, much of the process system engineering <laughs> to put all these uh, chemical engineering fields together and study the art of life. <laughs> yes, well, and my, my colleague, Nick, who, Nick Hod, who brought me into the center, he's 
um, in biochemistry at Georgia Tech, uh, but he's actually trained as a physicist. <laughs> and so that actually has been very important in us, in us being able to work together and have common communication and understanding. Um, uh, but, um, but, but still, um, you know, there's, he was interested in me coming in and doing modeling. Right. So he saw I was doing crystallization modeling, you know, assembly and polymerization modeling. So he just he really, I think, just thought, you know, I need someone to do modeling because he was trying to model it, but it kind of went beyond what he and his students would, would be doing. So uh, he was doing all the modeling. <laughs> so, um, but my interest <laughs> was not in you being like his modeling, you know, glass shop or whatever. <laughs> my interest was in the origin of feedback and in the optimization. Side. And that's fat, you know, that those questions were really fascinating to me. So, um, uh, you know, I think they're, I think they're all important <laughs> in terms yeah. of understanding the origin of, of life. But, you know, he, I think when he reached out to me, he didn't really understand, you know, why I would actually be super interested. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is a very fascinating subject. Of yeah. Congratulations for all you have done. Till now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Marisa, back to you. So, um, is there anyone else that wants to make another question? Um, uh, Martha, I would like to thank you very much again. It was really very interesting. Uh, many people are saying that in the chat. So, mm -hmm. thank you very much. I am, I am very glad and we are very honored to have you again here. And I hope uh, many other professors from the PSC area and catalysis area get interested and we can uh contribute more uh with you we would be very glad with that so thank you very much again thank uh, you I, I just appreciate i always appreciate all of you yes. and our collaboration and i had i thank you for reminding about you know our time together in florianopolis two years ago um uh when when we you know we all met for the first time and marcellus came and then you know marcellus came to atlanta yes. and so much has happened in the past two years but um thank you for for reminding about our time together in yes as ajimiro said when when you said that uh you had so that topic also as your research area ajimiro said no i think she is kind of playing with us it's but they <laughs> said no i will keep it I will talk uh, to her, maybe in another lecture, she will present it. And it really, really worked so well. So thank you so much. That's really very interesting. You are really a great researcher, a great example, uh, especially for women in PSC. So um, I'm really glad to have you here. And thank you so much. I think I can say that in the name of our program, graduate program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Hope so thank you, you also, everyone, for being here. And um, see you all in next, uh, in, in other seminars, in other events. And our students, uh, please, um, I'd like to welcome you all and have a very nice uh, period here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye.